Hello everyone, I'm Shimon Yu from Georgia Tech. Today is my great pleasure to present some of our research progress in the field of computing memory for artificial intelligence. I will first talk about the techniques to implement the inference, and then I will talk about the training. As you may know, hardware accelerators are becoming more and more important for AI implementations. GPU still dominates the training in the cloud, but we say FPGA is becoming a good choice for the inference fast prototyping. And also the digital ASIC implementations, such as Google's TPU, is ramping up in the cloud as well as the edge. If you look at the energy efficiency of those computing platforms, GPU can support up to 0.1 tera operations per second per watt or T ops per watt. GPU can achieve very good accuracy because it supports floating point computation. And the digital CMOS ASIC solutions, such as TPU, can reach 1 to 10 tera ops per watt with fixed point computation, for example, 8 bits. The question here is how to further increase the energy efficiency, especially for the edge devices. And we think that the analog CMOS with the computing memory architecture, especially with emerging number time memory, can achieve 10 to 100 tera ops per watt. But they may come with no precision computation. Then the question is, can they achieve the same accuracy as the digital implementations? So I will try to answer this question in the later part of the talk. So let's first look at the basics of the computing memory. And here we compare with the conventional deep neural network DNN accelerators with the ASIC CMOS implementations. And the typical design here is to have many of these PEs processing elements with the digital multiplier and adders. So here in the conventional accelerator, the weights and the activations of the neural network model are stored in the global buffer. For example, here's a shared SRAM cache. And then they are fetched into the computing units, PEs, for the actual computation. So the data transfer between the global buffer and the PEs becomes a bottleneck of the performance. On the other hand, if we look at the computing memory, CIM architecture, it has also many macros, but within the macro, the computation is done in the analog fashion. So here the weights are stored in the memory cells, and then the input activation are loaded in, in parallel to activate multiple word lines of the memory array. And then the voltage input multiplied by the conductance of the memory cell will result in current summation along the bit line. Then at the edge of the array, we may need to use analog to digital converter, ADCs, to digitize the output vectors. So in this approach, we can do the computation in parallel fashion, and then we can eliminate the digital MAC operations. And most importantly, the weights are stored in the memory array. So we only move the input and output activations around so we can save the energy in the data transfer. And then why emerging number time memory for the computing memory architecture? So here let's look at example of the resistive random access memory, RAN. As you may know, RAN is a two-terminal resistor with variable resistance. It can switch between a high range state and low range state by applying positive or negative voltage pulses. If you compare with SRAN as the same technology load, RRAN typically implemented with one transistor, one resistor bit cell. It can provide much smaller cell size and also possibly multi bit per cell. In other words, the integration density is much higher. As a result, it can may hold most of the weights on chip. 
here as a reference. Today's DNN model typically needs larger than 100 megabytes for the parameters. So if we can have on-chip memory capacity of this 100 megabytes, then we can reduce or even eliminate the off-chip DRAM memory access, which is a bottleneck of the system performance. And also the RRAM is normal tile memory. That means it can store the weights even after the power is off. So this is especially attractive for the edge devices where the standby is frequent. So we can do this dynamic power gating on the RRAM based accelerators. And also RRAM can be compatible with the backend of RAM fabrication or 3D stacking. So in this table, we summarize the recent progress of the array level demonstrations of the RRAM macro for the computing memory. And we see the progress in the technology load scaling and also the increase of the array size and also the integrated ADC and the remarkable Terra Ops per second per watt and also the uh, reasonable accuracy for more complex data set like the button. Next, I will talk about the DNN plus neural scene framework developed in our group to benchmark different kinds of computing memory architectures. So this is an overview of the framework. So it's an integration of the neural scene with PyTorch and TensorFlow to provide an end-to-end -end framework to benchmark different architectures. So neural scene core is implemented in C++. So it's a circuit model to estimate the performance of the circuits, like the energy efficiency, throughput, area, and memory utilization. It was built upon a hierarchy of the chip, tile, PE, subarray, with all the necessary peripheral circuits blocks, such as the decoder, marks, ADC, chip and add, input and out output buffer, and also the H tree based routing. And all the technology parameters are calibrated with the PTM model from 130 nanometer down to 7 nanometer. And then the neural scene is wrapped by the Python to interface with the PyTorch for TensorFlow. So it can define arbitrary neural network model and then report the inference and training accuracy with hardware constraints. For example, we introduce a device level retention model and the ADC quantization effect that may affect the inference accuracy. And also we introduce the device level nonlinearity, asymmetry, and variation effects for the on-chip training. And the framework is publicly available at the GitHub. There are two versions. The version 1.1 is for inference, and version 2.0 is for training. This is an overview of the key features of the framework. As we introduced, it can support both training and inference. So during the training, the nonlinearity and asymmetry of the devices will affect the accuracy. So here, we can look at the normalized conductance versus number of programming pulses. So the devices may increase the conductance follow the blue trajectory and decrease the conductance follow the red trajectory which may affect the training accuracy. And also we can include the device to device variations, cycle to cycle variations. For the feed forward inference only mode, we care about the data retention of the conductance. And uh, also we introduce the ADC quantization effect for the partial sum accumulation. So overall, those non-ideal effects may impact the training or the inference accuracy. On the hardware side, we can map arbitrary network into a chip follow plan with multiple tiles. And then we can unroll the activations into vector and also unroll the kernels into a matrix. So we can implement the neural network with real traces on the hardware. And also we can perform these hierarchical simulations from the top level chip tile down to the bottom level PE and subarray. 
So this is an example of the benchmark results with the framework for computing memory architectures for inference applications. And here the neural network model is VGG8 with 8 bit activation and 8 bit weight on CIFAR 10 data set. So first we benchmark technology as a 32 nanometer. This is because most of the non-volatile memory available today are integrated in the, for example, 28 nanometer, 40 nanometer, or 22 nanometer load. So we choose 32 nanometer load uh, as the platform to integrate the non-volatile memories from the r rand phase change memory to ferroelectric transistors, F effect. So we compare those emerging number of time memory with s rand as a stand technology load. And we can see that most of the emerging number of time memory can outperform the s rand as a stand technology load. And the critical parameters to enable this is unstated resistance. We can see that the good ones uh, with the unstable resistance, hundreds kilo ohm or, or above. So this is much better than this one, six kilo ohm. That's why it can reach very good energy efficiency. And we say that the FE fat is good because the uh, unstable resistance can be modulated by the gate bias because it's a three terminal device. But if you compare the emerging number of time memories at 32 nanometer with State of the art, like seven nanometer S run, still the seven nanometer S run can achieve the best energy efficiency and throughput simply because of the scaling. Then the question is how can the emerging number of time memory at older technology load beat the seven nanometer S run? Then the answer is the edge compute where the standby is frequent. So here we need to consider the practical scenario in the edge computation where the standby may be frequent. So here we vary the computation versus the standby ratio. For example, here, if the workload is compute intensive, then here we can see this red one, which is a seven nanometer S run, can achieve the best energy efficiency. But when the standby is more often, let's say the compute ratio is below 5%, then most of the emerging number time memory based design at 32 nanometer can achieve better energy efficiency than the seven nanometer s run simply because we can do the dynamic power gating. But the s run is always leaking, so we can achieve better energy efficiency for the edge devices with those number time memory, even at older technology load. And then let's look at the training performance of the computing memory architectures. Again, we compare different technologies with S1 at 32 nanometer first. And here for the training accuracy, we need to consider many of the device non-ideal effects, like the non-linearity, cycle-cycle variation, and so on. So those are the parameters extracted from the papers in the literature. And we can see that the training accuracy of many of the devices here are not good because of those uh, nonlinearity or the cycle cycle variations as we marked in the red color here. But still, like the FE fetch can achieve reasonable accuracy comparable with the software simply because the symmetric update and also reasonable cycle cycle variation. And also the increased unstable resistance can again help with energy efficiency. So here the last two rows show the peak throughput and peak energy efficiency. So here peak means the on-chip only performance without the DRAM access. So you can say that that FE fed can still achieve the best energy efficiency and the throughput at the 32 nanometer load. But the challenge here is the overall system performance. If we consider the DRAM access, then no matter which technology we use, the overall tells per watt is about two. This is because in the training process, we need to frequently fetch the data from the DRAM. 
due to the iterative process. Then the DRAM access will dominate the energy. That is still a challenge for the training architecture design. And a side note here is that the endurance requirement actually is not as high as you may think. We count the number of weight updates in the CIFA 10 data set, and we found that 10 to power 6 cycles is sufficient to achieve good accuracy. Then the next question is, what device property matter for inference? And here we think the multi-level stability is critical to maintain good accuracy for the inference. So here we assume different modes of the conductance drift over time. And the weights of conductance drift to the maximum, to the minimum, to the middle, or they randomly drift. Then we can use our framework to estimate the inference accuracy degradation over time uh, with different drift targets and different drift rates. And here, for example, we see the green curve, which is a randomly drift, can be most robust to the inference accuracy degradation. And then for the training, we want to answer this question. Is the symmetric weight update required for achieving high training accuracy? So this is a problem as we earlier introduced. In many of the devices today, when they increase the conductance, it may follow the blue trajectory. And then when it decreases the conductance, it may follow the red trajectory. So this is a, a symmetry in the weight update. And with this kind of asymmetry, we can see that the accuracy will quickly degrade with the nonlinearity level here from zero to eight, as we labeled in this plot. To overcome this kind of challenge, recently we found a technique from the algorithm point of view to introduce the momentum in the weight update. That means the delta W at the current time step does not only depend on the current step, but also it depends on the previous step. So we can accumulate this kind of momentum from the previous few step to finally determine the weight update in the current step. So if we do that, then here you can see the accuracy can maintain even up to the nonlinearity level six. It can reach at 89% of the accuracy if we employ this kind of momentum technique. So this is good news for the device engineering. We can relax the requirement on the nonlinearity and the symmetry with this kind of algorithm trick. Okay, next we are going to discuss our XNOR RN inference chip design. So this is to implement a binary neural network called XNORnet. And XNORnet binarizes the input and the weight to be positive one and negative one. Then the multiplication becomes XNOR computation. So here we have the 2T2R cell to implement one weight. And then at the end of the column, we have three bit ADC implemented by seven voltage mode sense amplifier to do the partial sum quantization. And here, this is a measured bit nine voltage as a, a function of the bit count value or the x nor partial sum value. And then the bit nine voltage will be sensed at this node by the ADC. And we can convert the partial sum to a digital value. And this is the actual tape out. And we designed 128 by 64 RAM array with all the peripheral circuitry, like the switch matrix, MUX, ADC, and so on. And the chip was fabricated at 90 nanometer with one bounce coupling oxide RAM process. And this is the layout. As you can see, the RAM array is pretty small, and the peripheral circuits actually take most of the area. So this is the measurement result of the chip compared to the state of the art uh, from um, Professor Chang's group. 
published in ISSCC 19. So here in our design, we have older technology nodes, but we turn on more rows simultaneously. So here with a similar precision, we can achieve better throughput simply because we turn on more rows at one time. Although our energy efficiency is lower, then the figure of merit here is the EDP, energy delay product. If we use that, then still our design can achieve like 10 times better than the prior design with a similar accuracy. And also recently we try to program the R into multi-bit per cell, then we can further increase the figure of merit here by like 100 times. But still you can say that the accuracy of those designs is less than the software baseline for the CIFAR 10 data set, which is typically 90%. In the next, we are going to discuss the challenges we learned from those chip design. So first, we see the challenges in the RM-based uh, computing memory chip. That is the relatively low on state of the resistance, which will result in very large column current. That means we have to size up the max at the edge of the array to deliver those currents. So this will result in the poor area efficiency as we see here in the layout of our chip. And also the programming voltage for the R1 is typically high and two or three volts. Then we need to size up the transistor to accommodate this kind of high voltage. So the bit cell size may be large. And also we need to spend a lot of area to convert the voltage domain from the digital control to the actual RM VLAN or BitLAN driver. This level shifter also occu uh, occupy a lot of space. And the second challenge is the ADC. As you see here, the ADC take a lot of area and also ADC is power hungry. And another challenge is that ADC is uh, kind of large compared to the column pitch. So we have to share multiple with one ADC. And the last challenge here is the process variation. Uh, this is analog computation, so we cannot avoid the process variation. For example, the ADC offset may generate inaccurate partial sum computation, which will result in the degradation in the inference accuracy, as we see earlier in our results. So here we see the power breakdown of the ADC. You can see that. 80% of the power spent on the uh, ADC. And also here we show the ideal ADC output versus the actual measured ADC output. Ideally, they should be on this diagonal, but due to the process variation, sometimes they are offset by one or two levels. So those are the challenges. Of course, we can try to tighten this kind of ADC offset by fine tuning the references for each ADC. Next, we want to discuss the technique to tighten the RN resistance. To accurately read out the column current within each RN cell to be identical in the resistance. So here we need to use so-called write and verified protocol to program the target resistance. For example, here around eight kilo, eight kilo ohm. Then here we use six iterations try to tighten the distribution and, and then we can achieve better readout accuracy. So with this kind of read, write verify, then we can eventually program three bits, eight level in our test chip. So here, this is a result experimentally. We program four kilobit cells for each state and when linearly spaced those states across the conductance range. So it can represent three bit weight. And here we achieve very tight sigma of the distribution, that's 1.5%. Um, While many prior work on market bit generally achieve like five to 15% of the sigma of the distribution. So with this kind of very tight distribution, we run the softwares uh, simulations and it can achieve 92% accuracy. So we see that with this kind of write and verify, then the conductance 
declaration is not a big issue. But still, as we presented earlier, ADC offset still will impact the accuracy. Then the next question is, after we program the RN to be in this multi-level state, then how stable are they? So here we perform the rate disturb experiments on our device. And here we see that on different states, if we apply the stress on the voltage, on the bitman, then the resistance will change over time. And uh, here the conclusion is that we need to maintain the rate voltage below 0.3 volt to minimize the impact of the rate disturb. Lastly, I want to briefly talk about how we move forward to the on-chip training. As we said earlier, FEFET is a good candidate to implement the training. And here we presented in the IEDM 2018 on a concept of the 2T1 FEFET hybrid synapse. So the idea here is, is to add two conventional CMOS transistors to attach to the gate node of the FEFET. So those two pull up and pull down transistor will modulate the gate voltage here, which will modulate the channel conductance of the FEFET if it's biased in the linear region. Then we can achieve fine tuning of the channel conductance by modulating the gate voltage through charging and discharging. So this can be used to represent the low significant bit of the weight. And we can achieve very good linear updates in those LSBs. But this is volatile because we rely on the gate cap to store those information. Then once in a while, we need to transfer this kind of volatile bits into the non-volatile states of the FE FET. That means we need to program the FE FET to a different multi-level. So here we show four levels of the FE FET state by changing the VTH threshold voltage. So we can further extend the conductance range to the most significant bits. In this case, four levels, two bits then we can have very high precision, for example, two bits for the MSB and the seven bits, oh, sorry, uh, five bit for the LSB. So in total, we can have seven bits hybrid synapse, which is very high accurate for the training. So with this kind of idea, then recently we further benchmark its architecture level performance. And uh, we have built the architecture with our neural scene framework. And uh, 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 we can have the FE FET based array. And then it can form the PE and then the tile. And then we consider the interconnect and off chip DRAM access. So I'll skip the details of the implementation. But the takeaway message here is that with this kind of FE FET based hybrid synapse, it can achieve the best energy efficiency and throughput and the smallest area compared to many other technologies like R run or even STDM run. So we think this is a, a promising direction to pursue. All right, so this is a summary of my talk. We have talked about the computing memory, which can save the intermediate data movement for the hardware accelerators which essentially improves the throughput and energy efficiency. Today's R run can be tuned into multi-level, possibly by iterative programming. As demonstrated in our case, we can achieve three bit per cell. We think the offline training for inference is the most suitable applications because it can offer the low leakage and non-volatility over S run. This is especially good for the edge computing. We also notice the slight inference accuracy degradation in the analog computing memory architecture caused by the process variation, such as ADC offset. So we think that maybe we have to fine tune the ADC reference, and also we can do some retraining of the model from chip to chip. Of course, this will bring in the overhead of the testing. The RM-based inference engine still faces the challenges such as high 
programming voltage, no unstate resistance, ADC overhead, and intermediate state stability. We need to do further research on those problems. And our group provides this DNM plus neurosync framework for benchmarking different technologies, and this is open source to the community. Finally, we think that FEFET is a promising candidate that needs further exploration. All right, I'd like to thank my collaborators, Professor Jason Seal from Arizona State on the RM based design, and also Professor Truman Data on the FEFET based design. And of course, all the students and postdocs involved in this research. Finally, I would like to thank the sponsors supporting this research. Thank you. Bye bye.